Okay, so hi, I'm Brian Cardell from Egalia, and uh, if you listen to some of our other Egalia chats, this one will be a little bit different in all of the other ones. They've been one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, but today I'm here with two friends who I think there's pretty good chance that folks will already know. Um, they've been longtime advocates of the open web and web standards, blog and write and give keynotes at conferences, so... Um, you probably know them, but just in case, I'd like to give them the opportunity to do quick introductions and say hi. So if you could introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Stuart Langridge. Um, I'm, a, I'm a consultant, I suppose, these days. Um, but yeah, uh, you can find me as at SIL on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I'm, I've been a long-time advocate of the open web. Hooray. I, I invented ping back, but that was a mistake. <laughs> And uh, I'm Jeremy Keith. I'm one of the co-founders of Clear Left, a digital design agency in Brighton, UK. All right. So uh, there's a com conversation that we've had in the web community for uh, a long time uh, framed about rendering engines and the diversity of them and why it matters. The three of us and even some other people have had a, sort of a lot of conversations about and uh, I wrote a blog post recently, which attempts to offer that view is not wrong, but it is perhaps incomplete. Uh, follow on, Stuart wrote a piece with some additional thoughts. Um, and then there was a lot of discussions following on the Twitter. So we thought it would be good to, you know, get together and talk about it. So in my piece, uh, I suggest that... Um, like I say, this view is perhaps incomplete and ultimately maybe not as practically useful as some other ways of looking at it. And that depending on how you look at it, you can wind up with very different conclusions. So maybe it's good for us to shift the conversation a little bit so that we do talk about those other things. So I started with an analogy from one of Jeremy's posts. So I'm wondering, Jeremy, maybe you could recap that analogy. So well in in my post I was kind of talking about how I can um I can understand the arguments that say that um losing browser or rendering engine diversity isn't so bad um but even if I don't agree with it um and the way I put it is it's kind of like you're we're we're moving a line of uh where we agree to cooperate and where we agree to differentiate and in the past, that line was definitely lower because there wasn't even an agreement that we would cooperate on web standards, right? So there was no agreement and it was all differentiation when it came to web browsers in the early days. But pretty soon we realized that there needed to be a level of agreement. So this bar gets raised and it's like, okay, now we're all going to agree to cooperate on the web standards, but then they will differentiate on our rendering engines and all the other things that browsers do. And what's happened more recently is the bar has been raised again. It's like, okay, we'll agree to cooperate on web standards and rendering engine, and we'll differentiate on some other stuff, you know, the, the browser UI, for example. Hmm. So I understand the argument, but um, the analogy I ended up drawing was, was towards political parties. Um, and if we were to look back at you know when the when the bar was much lower regard cooperation, it was it was like a situation where you've got lots and lots and lots of different political parties with no overall majority, and there's uh, it's very difficult to get anything done because there's there's everyone's doing their own thing, and I think we could all agree well that's not great. However, what's really not great is when you you only have one political party. Right, so a totalitarian state, um, they don't need to worry about cooperation because there's nobody they have to cooperate with. It's just one par one party system, and we generally, I think, agree that a one party system is not good. So uh, it's all about getting that balance, I guess, um, and that's the analogy: is a one party system. Yeah, and actually, I I have not actually heard any reaction from you about the things that I read into this analogy, but one of the things that I said that I liked about it is that um, it, it sort of points to the fact that you said, like, we generally agree. We don't talk about that because it's almost self-evident, right? Like we don't, 
more or less general agreement that one is too few, but too many is also not helpful. And so we know it should be a small number, but there's many ways you can look at that where like, do how close are those two parties, right? Like, I mean, if, if they're, if they barely disagree, that's not actually much difference. And um, if some of those groups are like, not participating well, like they're not good actors, then adding them is not helpful either. So there's like a number of ways you can, you can look at that. Just really quickly, let's talk about the one. I I looked really hard to see if I could find um, this quote and I couldn't. And so I wonder if maybe there's a reason for that. Um, So I don't want to quote it, but I, I see very little evidence that there is a strong push for a single engine. But do do you see otherwise? Yeah, no, I've definitely or? I've heard developers uh, push for that. In the past, it was WebKit. So the the specific engine changes with time, but uh, this comes up over and over again. Generally, from um, developers who weren't there, man, you know, who didn't uh, live through the the dark days, and say, wouldn't it be great if every browser used the same engine? Why don't we all just use WebKit? This is a few years back when WebKit was you know ruling the roost. Um, but you know, it comes up all the time. I hear it. I hear it all the time. And and to enlarge on that slightly, I think there's two uh, separate ways of looking at that. You've got at least some developers pushing for the idea that there should be one engine, and I that gets dressed up in a lot of ways. But it's basically it would make my job easier if it was like this, which it would undeniably make it easy if you could just develop for Chrome, just develop for Blink. Um, but then I think there's another thing, which is that it's not necessarily that people are pushing for one engine, but it's kind of that way anyway. If one company achieves a certain amount of market dominance, then you end up with essentially one engine. I mean, uh, Jeremy mentioned the, the bad old days, which we all lived through when there was IE and that was it. If you didn't work in IE, you didn't work anywhere. And people just developed for IE because what was the point in looking at anybody else? But to a first approximation, and a bunch of people are going to disagree with me here, but to a first approximation, apart from on iOS, everything's Chrome these days. So we are largely in that position anyway. Um, Mozilla are now down to somewhere in between 5 and 15%, depending on who you listen to. And so there's not that much competition anyway. It's, it's segregated by platform, certainly. But on a given platform, there's not very much competition at all. So th- this actually, I think that you made kind of two or three points in there that play into nicely what the rest of the article is about, actually, which is, um, uh, for one thing, um, when uh, Microsoft won the web in the early days, depending on who you listen to, they controlled somewhere upward of 95%. Um, and the remaining browsers were... There was Opera, and they controlled a very tiny, you know, like one or two percent. Then there was Firefox, but Firefox was an open sourcing of Netscape, and so if you break those out, none of those browsers had more than one or two percent. And the the browser vendor Microsoft had stepped away. Like the W three C had said, like this web is done. That was an interesting experiment, but now we're going to go build the real thing. And so Microsoft disbanded the IE team. Um, This is held up as one of the reasons that diversity matters. And I I agree with it. But there's another way of looking at this as well, which is it was doomed at that point because Microsoft was proprietary and single OS and like a single vendor could work on it. But the history of the web has shifted us in the other direction, where now every single browser engine is open source. And they all have multiple collaborators, and they're all multi-OS. So I think that that is actually a really healthy thing. Aside from a conversation about diversity, that is a really healthy turn, is what I intend to say. Um, Do you agree with that? or? Oh, I certainly think that you know, open source is better than closed source with, well, just about any software, certainly with browser rendering engines. Not sure it mitigates the need for diversity. And yeah, similarly, I would, 
I would certainly agree that it's a material improvement, a massive improvement over how things used to be. Because there is now the possibility for people to get involved without going to work on one of two or three teams at large software companies, Mm -hmm. which is great. But Jeremy's point, I think, is reasonable. There's... um, it doesn't mitigate the need for diversity. I don't think that I'm trying to make the case that discussions about browser diversity are wrong. Um, I do think that browser diversity is important. And I agree that one is too few and that 100 is too many. And that the answer is in the small numbers. Um, but I do think that there is something about that being open source that keeps them potentially more viable and vibrant than they are in another situation. I, and I guess that's that's sort of my point. Like in theory, at least, had Opera or Microsoft been open source, it is very plausible that, I mean, it is at least possible. Plausible is a whole other topic, which will be the next part, <laughs> um, that somebody could take that over and keep it going. Yes, um, I'll buy that. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that people who wanted um, to keep those browsers going could do so. I don't know who out there would want to choose Internet Explorer by choice rather than because they were made to by some constraint or other. I wonder how much different that would have been if other people could have contributed as well. Like it is very, they're very, they're very intertwined, right? Um, Like these, these concepts are very intertwined because IE was at one point a very good browser. Like IE6, when it came along, was actually pretty great. 5.2, IE 5.2 for the Mac. Great browser. Yeah. But then they just dismissed the team and everything moved on and they stayed where they were. But if other people could have been contributing along the way, if whatever that could be different but i guess this gets into now the the other aspect of this which is the nuts and bolts which i think is important because um talking about browser engine diversity in this way there is not much we can practically do about it except choose to use a browser in unless you can contribute the only other thing you can do is choose to use a browser and you will only choose to use a browser if it's a good browser (laughs) Or you're on a platform which denies you the ability to make a choice otherwise. Sure. I guess part of my premise is also that um, it is in some ways more valuable to talk about things that are more within our control because there are plenty of things that we can do to keep the web ecosystem healthy and vibrant and alive and talk about it in ways that are um, were like previously we didn't look at it that way. So I know... Stuart had, in in his article, had some points that were about what you could and couldn't affect. Do you want to maybe try to capture that? Uh, Sure. Um, My acknowledging the fact that um, all the browser engines being open source is, you know, a, a huge improvement over how it used to be. And in theory, you can rock up and contribute any change. And that's great. But my concern is that that only applies to uncontroversial changes. Now, um, I got quite a lot of pushback on Twitter about this <laughs> um, from uh, people uh, working for browser teams who deny that it's the case. But I'm not 100% sure I buy the argument. So some of the examples I gave were um, if you show up to the Blink repository and contribute a really good um, built-into-the-browser ad blocker that lets you trivially block a load of ads, Google are going to say, yeah, we're not taking that because they have a business reason to deny it. Not a technical reason, just a business reason to not allow it in. Uh, At least some people on the Chrome team pushed back on that quite strongly and said, no, that's not the case at all. And there already is an ad blocker inside inside blink for bad ads and that's all fine and that's evidence that we don't do that but i'm not entirely convinced about this in the same way if you show up and contribute a brilliant pwa implementation to webkit 
does that mean it's going to show up in iOS Safari? Answer, probably not. Um, and again, the Apple team may say, no, 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 we'd happily accept that if someone showed up and did it. And again, I'm not convinced. Um, it depends whether you think that when you've got a major commercial sponsor of a browser engine, so the people who use it to build their uh, browser, so uh, obviously um, Google for Blink, uh, Apple for WebKit, Mozilla for Gecko, whether putting something into the browser engine means that it will show up in their browser, whether they're prepared to do the work to patch that back out if they don't want it, if they're prepared to carry stuff in their browser engine that they don't want in their browser, and then they do extra work to remove it from their browser if it conflicts with their business model, or whether you think they wouldn't allow it into the browser engine at all. And we're a bit short on test cases for this, so it comes down to one's personal feeling, or put another way, one's prejudice for or against. But that was the discussion I wanted to have happen. I'm and so Jeremy's example of political parties, and I, I don't want to be all political here, but there are some political ideals which are hard to get any political party to buy into because they degrade the experience of political parties as a whole, right? So um, if you're trying to disenfranchise MPs, for example, because you think there should be a different way of running the government, then... It's hard to get any traction with any political party, regardless of their political position, because that's about them. They they have a unified interest. And this feels like a similar thing. It's hard to get some discussions on the table. Look at the um, all the furore over the video element when it was first created. And we are still in a position where there is not a video format that you can publish videos in, which works everywhere. Because there was a bunch of business model stuff. Now, the fact that the engines were open source made no difference to that. And there was an open source implementation which was being contributed, didn't get taken up. And even if it was put into the browser engines, it didn't show up. So I feel like um, the engines being open allows someone to implement uh, a non-controversial change, which basically isn't in people's browsers because the the commercial sponsors time is limited their resources are limited so they haven't got as far as being able to do everything they want to yet but if you show up with a controversial change it still feels to me like the major vendors reserve the right to say no and steer the strategic direction of their browsers in a way that outsiders don't get to and the question is is I mean, maybe that's just reasonable. Maybe that's just the way things should be. But the reason I wrote the post was because it felt a little bit like we were saying, everything's open source now, anyone can contribute, that's great. But it's not quite as much of a panacea as I would like it to be. One of the things that perhaps requires context of maybe some of my other blog posts and things is trying to explain how much uh, from the outside we talk about what appears to be happening and paint it as if it is like incredibly rigid political strategic discussion or something when in many cases it's not it's much simpler things that are about managing priorities and things like that not to again not to say that there is nothing like that they do have opinions and actually it's interesting because i thought one of the reasons that we like diversity is because there are opinions. I'm I'm not sure I follow what you're aiming at with that. If all of the open source implementations just need to redo the same thing and no maintainer is able to have any veto power, that would be very new. And it is basically then why not just have one, right? Um, but I'm saying really most things that we think are somehow somebody taking a hard stance because whatever we imagine is like a firm line in the sand because some business model or something most most of it is not that actually and even the ones that we imagine that maybe have some truth to them that is frequently the, the line is very movable and we, we can eventually get to a place where we 
where we do build consensus that is workable, right? So maybe there is perhaps not a single video format, but it is we can easily make video using declarative markup that works in every browser. Yeah, I mean, and, and that was, um, so I talked about some of the pushback and some of that was from uh, Macho from Apple, um, who explicitly said that Igalia made WebKit contributions that affected Apple's strategic direction for Safari web platform features, which, yep. you know, is an indication that maybe that does happen. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Um, part of the point of the discussion was, part of the point of bringing the discussion up was to hear examples of that on on both sides i'm i say i'm i'm still not 100 percent convinced but i'm slightly more convinced than i was when i wrote the thing yeah i mean i i can it, it depends on what you consider strategic direction um but i like i can give you lots of examples where there are things that weren't being done in one browser where we've stepped in grid is the one that people hold up a lot because it's very it's big and it's popular and you know we, like we helped make that happen where it wasn't getting the priority and if you looked in back when it was early days people would have said that seems like controversial somehow M- mathml is another example that everybody assumed is extraordinarily controversial and you'll never get it into chrome but we're getting it into chrome there are lots of other examples uh, hardware acceleration unification of the svg and css models were we're working on that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of examples. We could cite a whole bunch. I don't know. Uh, Jeremy, you're awfully quiet. But share your thoughts. Well, I think, you know, with a lot of coming back to the, the political analogy, um, a lot of what this is about is representation. So actually, number of parties, maybe it doesn't make a difference. You know, if, if, even if there is only one party, but that party represents 100% of the population, then maybe there's no, no problem there. But in practice, that tends not to happen. You tend to have some people who aren't being represented in a one-party or even two-party system, the people who are on the fringes on the outside. Um, as long as the main players are representing the most amount of people, then things are pretty good, I guess. But I do still think that there is a value in diversity for its own sake, um, just in, in terms of having you know, different ideas, different priorities, uh, working, you know, to agree on standards or implementations, what have you, is is a good thing. Whether it's browsers, whether it's making software, whether it's making anything, um, having a diverse range of priorities, viewpoints, is a good thing. I think that even if the if we, if we had a monoculture, but it was, you know, the good kind of monoculture that genuinely represents what everybody wants, um, it still feels dangerous. Kind of, I guess, in the same way, in security terms, uh, you try to avoid, you know, having a large attack surface, right? So um, you have to always keep your WordPress uh, CMS uh, patched for vulnerabilities, not because it's any more or less vulnerable than some other CMS, but because it's so popular that it's uh, it's a target, right? Um, and I think the analogy might be might be true here is that if uh, if we develop blind spots because we're all contributing to one uh, browser rendering engine, we won't know what we won't know. We won't know uh, ideas and viewpoints and uh, priorities that that are shut out from the get-go. Yeah. So uh, I feel like this is an interesting question because um, I talk about how we have three today uh, rendering engines. And even part of the post is trying to convince people that we have three because... Uh, conversations always turn to, well, there's really only one that matters or there's, you know, one is only there because of X or one isn't really relevant or whatever. So we have three today and they are open source. So if I had to ask you to judge, like, is that a healthy ecosystem if we can maintain it, if they can maintain their vibrance? And well, as, as Stuart said, if the, the number doesn't matter so much as the amounts. So if you have one of those three has a market share that's in the high 90s, the fact that the other two even exist hardly matters, as we saw from um, Microsoft's dominance with Internet Explorer back in the day. So the, the, the number, you know, if it was three browsers with 33% market share, then yeah, you know, that would be some good proportional representation. But how do you think that we take action on that? I think 
like one way we could do it is to use open source to make those other browsers somehow more competitive. But there's an interesting conversation here about like, I don't know, maybe Firefox is just really an awesome browser, but for whatever reason, can't get the market share. So I guess, like, what do we do about it is the question. I don't think there's anything we do about it. Um, I don't think there's anything we can do about it. This is, um, to a first approximation, there is no technical difference between the major browser engines at this point, unless you're right up on the edge of something brand new. There's no, there's nothing that you do which even causes you a major problem. I'm sure there are web developers around the world listening to this, tearing their, um, crying their eyes out and tearing <laughs> at their hair saying, what are you talking about? That's rubbish. It's, I have to do all this work to do cross-browser testing and I have to fork all over the place. But largely, I don't think it's the case unless you're doing something which is, you, you know, if, if you're right at the can I use edge where most mm. of the boxes are red, Pretty much everything works pretty much everywhere now. This is a huge, huge improvement over how it used to be. So people are largely not choosing uh, their browser on technical merit uh, and on technical achievement. Chrome did a very good job of focusing on performance back in its early days. So th their pitch was, we're way faster than the browser you're using. And it was the truth because they put a load of effort into uh, performance of web pages, performance of the browser itself, in a way that the others hadn't yet. And that was a rising tide raising all boats thing because everyone else went, wow, Chrome's getting loads of browser share, market share from this. We better do performance too. And now everyone's more performant and hooray, that's good. But largely, I think people are not choosing their browser based on its rendering engine being significantly more competent than the competition. Uh, the reason they're making the choices is something else. Yeah, this goes back to what I was saying about that bar kind of being raised. So whereas in the past, like I said, you know, to begin with, we weren't even collaborating on web standards. Then we agreed, okay, we collaborate on web standards, but we'll have different, quite different rendering engines with quite different, you know, capabilities. And now it's like, as Stuart said, well, the rendering engines are pretty much on an equal footing. And so the differentiation is happening in stuff that's beyond the rendering engine. It's stuff like the other features the browser gives you, like uh, privacy, right? Um, tr blocking trackers and stuff like that. So another way to put that is priorities. So a company that has one set of priorities will, will you know, pimp out their browser, which is rendering engine plus priorities, um, to have UI features that, that, you know, will favor some features and a different browser maker can technically be pretty much equivalent in terms of web standard support, but have a very, very different feature set in terms of things like, yeah, um, blocking surveillance and, and uh, or maybe taking a stance on DRM and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I think that's where the differentiation happens. Stuart is absolutely right. That's the reason why people choose one browser as another way. In the past, you would have chosen a browser by saying, oh, this browser is just better right? This browser has better support for standards. This browser has better support for some features. And these days, yeah, I mean, the, the support is pretty much on an equal footing. So it's those other things above that bar that are the reason why people choose different browsers and should be free to choose different yeah, browsers. Yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, um, there is a distinction here between um, uh, Mozilla and the others because, uh, as was pointed out to me, um, Mozilla ship what's in master. If um, there's no separate proprietary version of Firefox, which is the thing that actual users get, um, unlike the other two where Chrome is not quite Chromium um, and iOS Safari is not just a shell around WebKit. And, but even that aside, the, the things where uh, competition is happening tend to be things which are much less open to influence by outside contributors either because they're about uh, operating system integration or they're about the closed source bits of the browsers or they're about strategic direction and marketing plans. I mean, no matter how open source you make Chromium, I can't make the Google search engine page put a thing saying, hey, why not install Chrome at the top of it? Or why not install Stuart browser at the top of it? I can't make Google inbox only work in 
in my browser and not in Chrome. I can't make um, Apple's uh, – I, 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 can't, I can't make – when Apple streams WWDC or whatever it is, I can't make it pop up a thing on my Android phone which says, hey, use Chrome instead of Safari. <laughs> and I think – that's the kind of thing I was meaning about strategic direction, that it's it's things that aren't technical and therefore are much less subject to outside contribution and outside influence, precisely because they're not things which are checked into GitHub and can't sensibly be checked into GitHub. The thing you were saying about Gecko and uh, the proprietary things, um, so both WebKit and Chromium have... Uh, and it, Gecko as well, but uh, it's a little bit different. All of the browser projects are open and you can think about them as being like the middle Lego brick. They're not the bottom and they're not the top. So it's not just you slap a skin on it. You also need the OS level bindings and like you need to make it work on the different OSs and all that kind of stuff. So like in WebKit, each of the ports has their own low level piece as well as whatever then we put atop that as a browser uh the other thing which is about the things you said about like uh, the google search page saying you know download chrome or microsoft shipping internet explorer with the operating system or you know whatever like there are sure there are advantages there and i i i sort of don't know what we can do about them like i Part of me is interested in the, I mean, we talk and you read my posts and you know I'm super interested in the theory, but I'm more interested in like where the wheels hit the road. Like what can we do? What are the practical, actionable things we can do to improve? Because just merely shouting into the wind is not useful either, right? Well, I think we're, I think where we, you know, tend to work on improving things is, is at um, I guess one, uh, the middle layer of the, the biscuit you're describing, um, which is still at the web standards part. So maybe not so much about getting those web standards into the rendering engine that ships with the browser that's owned by the company. So all that stuff, you know, certainly browser part and company part, we can't influence. Even the rendering engine part, yeah, in theory, we can, sh you know, ship some code into a rendering engine. But I think the the, the practical place where we have most influence is at the level of of the web standards even if it's just by demonstrating uh the wish for something to exist right that that idea of representation if the people that are making the rendering engines that go in the browsers that are owned by the companies are supposed to be representing what uh, people want then we as people can kind of show up to say well we want this and uh, we'll, we'll work on that with you so i think where we influence is still down at that level middle level, I guess. It's important that they be vibrant and practical and maintainable. Uh, the, the, those last two are really important. If not, they will not continue to exist. And then no matter what we want, we it's, you know, that will be the, the case. How do we retain the diversity that we have now? And is there a way we could in, like imaginably increased diversity. Like I, I had an idea in my post about how we might get one more engine. I don't know. I'm curious for your thoughts if you have any. Well, I, I mean, I think use Firefox as a short-term thing. You know, more people, like I said, if, if it was closer to 33% market share for all the different engines, that would be great. So anything we can do to push it towards that number, great. But on a more practical level, you know, maybe it needs to become a real problem um, in order for it to be tested, right? So in the situation with Internet Explorer, it was when it became the real problem. So the fact that it had 90-whatever percent market share wasn't really a problem until uh, Microsoft disbanded the team and there were no more updates. And then that's it. the situation was interpreted as damage and rooted around with the creation of, of Firefox. Um, and so maybe if the situation were to deteriorate today and... Um, you know, say Firefox disappeared or, or whatever, then that situation would be interpreted as damage and uh, something new would come along or, or the, you know, the same rendering engine would be maintained by a different uh, consortium, perhaps. Um, I guess it's what I'm saying is it's it's a bit theoretical today because 
as you point out, it's actually working pretty okay today. I mean, that could change from one day to the next and people could lose representation and it would be an unfair situation. But actually, right now, things are okay. So it is, yeah, maybe more about keeping things more or less as they are, trying to get maybe more the um, the numbers to change, the amounts of market share to change rather than, you know, numbers of rendering engines. Um but I, I do hold out hope that if things were to get bad in terms of representation and diversity, that again it would be interpreted as damage and and rooted around. Yeah, I I am less keen on this possibility. Um, even ignoring the fact that um, if you let things get bad, then that means things have got bad, which is you know bad. It's right there in the name. But more importantly, I think um, the thing which is different now to what it was many years ago is that a web browser is now i would say by some distance the most complicated program on any machine um so the barrier to entry for a new player is really high um i mean yes google got into it and built chrome and they had the advantage of being able to start with webkit apple built WebKit, and they had the advantage of being able to start with KHTML. They had to do an awful lot of work to it to make it into WebKit, but nonetheless, they had somewhere to start. But those are the two biggest companies on earth. Um, half of Mozilla's problem is that they don't have a war chest with billions of pounds in it. And there are a bunch of people out there who would say, and possibly rightly, that that's because they don't have a business model. Um, and... There's a there's a point to that, but essentially what that means is there is no business model of just making a browser, um, unless you're using that to push something else that you're selling. You can't sell browsers themselves. So realistically, where's the next player going to come from? Who's going to say it's worth me spending billions of dollars to get into this game? And it's hard to see where that next thing comes from. Um, Mozilla survive on a combination of uh, largesse and nostalgia and the fact that they had a much more dominant position in the past. Um, plus, they're the ones flying the flag for it's possible to build a browser without massive corporate support. But we're still starting to see the lie in that now and if they go away i don't necessarily see where anyone else is coming from because it's hard to imagine who would find it worthwhile to get into this game that's a very good point the the, the complexity of building a browser is is yeah you're right it's completely different now than than it was in the past yeah. three three things so these are all, all of these are related and they're all in my post to add to your list of an X beget Y, um, yeah. <laughs> even even Microsoft Internet Explorer and Mosaic came from previous things. Yeah. So Mosaic was a rewrite of Netscape as a new, like a, a new open source version that was trying to fix problems with its old past. But its old past and Microsoft Internet Explorer both had the same past, which were both Mosaic. Like they they were licensed and, uh, you know, like they or created by the same people. And, you know, yeah, we don't have like the birth of a whole brand new rendering engine and JavaScript engine integration that is fully complete. We will only probably get that through evolution, right? And I think that's why I think that the open source thing is really positive because it, without that, that's not possible, right? Uh, uh, you, um, software can't evolve unless it's open source. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're in a position where Microsoft couldn't afford to devote the resources to build a competing browser. Microsoft, who have all the money in the universe, <laughs> looked 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 at this market and went. Yeah, we can't afford to spend the money and the time that it will take to build something like this. So we're just going to take Chromium and then devote our efforts to the bits that make it edge. The, you know, in terms of what we can do, there there's something I think we can do. And I, you know, I kind of 
brushed off the idea, well, we can we can use Firefox, but there is something to that. We can at least defend what Firefox is doing or what Mozilla is doing in terms of of having diversity and push back against an idea that I did see come from an engineer at Microsoft after the announcement that they would be switching rendering engines, which was this idea that what Mozilla is doing is actively harmful, that by wasting their time building a separate rendering engine when they could be contributing so much more to the web by contributing to the one rendering engine to rule them all, that 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 that's somehow a bad thing, what Mozilla are doing, um, which obviously I strongly disagree with. And I think, as I said, you know, diversity for its own sake is, is a positive thing. So uh, I think what we can do is push it back against that that idea. And to be fair, this isn't, you know, a party line I've heard from other people at Microsoft or or Google, but um, I understand the argument. I just disagree with it very strongly. And from a um, an organizational political point of view, it's difficult to get that kind of thing through because lots of people say, yeah, yeah, we should all use, we should all standardize and use one thing. But what it almost always means is all of you other heathens should renounce your heathenry and come and join the true faith. Right. Um, so everyone is happy for everyone is happy to standardize on one thing as long as it's their thing. I, I'm not 100% sure you get past that. I mean, this is, um, to put it mildly, not a sentiment unique to technology. <laughs> so, Some of the people who are making the statement are not saying there should be only one browser or there should be only one implementation. What they're saying is something considerably more subtle than that, um, which is like there should be one main reference implementation architecture that you would still then have all these browsers, but on a whole bunch of things they would not have to, they would collaborate in concrete ways rather than just at the words level and then have to go and re-implement every single piece. I don't know if that makes any difference, but I, I, I do see a difference there that I think is important that I would hate to paint too differently than I know that they're trying to talk about. I mean, it's it's a bit like the, the argument on monoculture of crops. I mean, technically, yeah, we don't need that many different crops, right? We can just use the, the most popular ones, but uh, then we are running the danger, like I said, that large attack surface, that um, not knowing what we're missing, what we're missing out on. I think the topic of how we could get another one is interesting. I was sort of hoping that it would generate a little bit more discussion than it did on the Twitters, because the other thing that we haven't talked about here is that there are these, these ones that we don't talk about so much, which are implementations of the standards. But there is no can I use that includes them. But if they did, it would be very, very ragged. And it would also include supersets of things that the platform has not in browsers caught up to yet, which is also a whole misunderstood thing that's its own show. But I propose that those things like Prince XML and Antenna House and Amazon has a, a Silk browser and they have also EPUB system and that all have a need for a rendering engine. And a lot of them are not using browser rendering engines. They're not working on the same project, so they can't they can't share any of that lift, you know? So so this is an interesting dichotomy of this problem, right? Because they are diverse, but sometimes they're diverse in ways that I don't know that they're healthfully diverse. Maybe like maybe these other engines would benefit if we would either get them behind Gecko or WebKit and make those engines more viable with more contributors and doing greater things. Or maybe they could get together and while maybe one of them doesn't have a business model together, I guess that's kind of all the time that we have. So thanks for joining me. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing? Uh, use Firefox. Um, I'll buy that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm currently looking at Firefox window. And so, yes. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.